from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I am Estefania Bravo and this is From the South. The Venezuelan government is debunking for media's fake news coverage of Venezuelan migration in the region. Vice President Delcy Rodriguez and Communications Minister Jorge Rodriguez have also condemned xenophobic attacks against Venezuelan migrants. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Venezuela is the second most popular country in South America for migrants to head to and has some of the lowest numbers of emigrants in South America. There has been an attempt by some governments from the Lima Group that messed with the Security General of the Organization of the American States, destroying the little credibility the organization has, and now they're trying to do the same thing with the United Nations. It is disgusting to see how the centers of power in Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia have tried to seed fear to promote hate crimes against citizens from a country that has received their population. 5,600,000 Colombians in Venezuela have received food, education, health care, housing. We haven't put them in any shelters. If they say there is a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela, why these Colombians do not flee our country? And meanwhile, Venezuelans in Peru want to benefit from the return to the homeland plan. Hundreds of Venezuelans are chanting, we want to leave outside the Peruvian embassy. They are asking the government to send them back to Venezuela. We want to go back fast. There are Venezuelans here that are in the streets without food. We want to go back as soon as possible. I have small kids. Yes, we made a mistake to come here, but we want to go back. And Argentina has announced more austerity measures in an attempt to stabilize the troubled economy. President Mauricio Macri laid out the changes in a televised address. More than half of government ministries will be cut. Plus, there will be stiff taxes on exports to reduce budget deficits. This comes after last week's dramatic collapse of the currency. We know that is a bad tax, which goes against what we want to promote. We want to promote more exports to generate more quality work in every corner of Argentina. But I have to ask you to understand that this is an emergency and we need your support. And Finance Minister Nicolas Dujov says the government wants to achieve fiscal balance by 2019. Dujov will travel to Washington to meet the head of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, on Tuesday. Argentina signed a 50 billion US dollar loan with the IMF. In 2019, we want to reach the primary fiscal balance, before interest of course. Then in subsequent years, we will increase that result to also cover with the primary surplus the payment of interest on the debt and already have a financial equilibrium. Our correspondent in Buenos Aires, Edgardo Esteban, has more. President Mauricio Macri has announced new measures to face the economic crisis. The government will cut down on the number of ministries in less than half in order to stabilize public spending and reduce the deficit. However, this will lead to massive layoffs. In the agro-industry ministry, 560 workers have lost their jobs in the past 24 hours. He also announced a tax on exports as an emergency measure to balance the accounts of the state. He said these were the worst five months of his administration after the country's currency has crashed to record lows. Finance Minister Nicolas Duhovne also announced other policy changes. He also said he will travel to the United States to hold meetings with the IMF to renegotiate new economic agreements in relation with the 50 billion standby finance loan they got from the financial institution. Thank you, Edgardo, for your report. And we continue in Argentina, where former President Cristina Fernández de Kirchner reappeared in court on Monday. Fernández must testify about an alleged corruption network discovered during her term. So far, 12 businessmen and high-ranking officials linked to the case have been arrested. Fernández has denied any wrongdoing. She has also denounced this as political persecution. And Brazil's vice presidential candidate, Fernando Haddad, has visited former president Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva in Curitiba. Haddad wants to define the Workers' Party strategy after the Electoral Supreme Court banned Lula from running for the presidency. 
The PT insists Lula is its candidate, although Haras could replace him. The electoral court has banned any campaign ad where Lula appears. And Brazil has lost some of its most precious historical artifacts after a huge fire swept through the National Museum. Firefighters battled through the night to control the blaze in the Boa Vista neighborhood of Rio de Janeiro. The museum has just celebrated its 200th anniversary. Its collection includes almost 20 million items. The fire has been dampened. We worked here on education with different groups from around the world. It's a loss, and without words. It's a loss for the world. This can never be recovered for the people, for the building. There is no way to get it back. Thankfully, no one died. But the loss can never be recovered. And social movements in Mexico mobilized over the weekend to reject the sixth and final annual report by the Enrique Peña Nieto administration. The demonstration ended outside the same parliament building where a new left-wing majority legislator has been sworn in. Teachers from the Education Workers Union took to the streets of Mexico City to condemn once again President Peña Nieto's education reform. As the outgoing government delivered its last annual report, they called on President-elect Andrés Manuel López Obrador to include the unions in preparing a new kind of education. We want to tell Peña Nieto that his education reform has failed. In spite of his attempts to remove our rights and our job security, it has failed. With Mexico's 64th Congress beginning its work, social movements outside drew attention to the dire state of the public health service. They admit us to hospital in chairs on the floor. There are no medicines, no gas. Once there was no machine to check my heart. Inside the Congress, the new session was underway. For the first time, there is a left-wing majority in Parliament, led by Morena and its ally, the Party of Labour. I think that on July 1st, Mexicans punished the PRE and Peña Nieto for a series of failures in investigations against corruption over the president's White House, Odebrecht, and the terrible case of the 43 disappeared Ayosinapa students. It is the first time that the people are fully represented in this sovereign body. 308 members of the coalition, almost two-thirds together with the new president. We will make history. It's a big responsibility. They will have their work cut out. They'll need to review the raft of neoliberal reforms passed by the previous Congress, where the PRI, now reduced to the third party in Congress, approved changes to the Constitution in relation to energy, education and the banks. They will also have to create a new Ministry of Public Security and approve a new Attorney General. And Bolivia's President Evo Morales and his Peruvian counterpart Martin Vizcarra are heading a binational summit in the Bolivian city of Cobija. The two leaders will discuss about the construction of the bioceanic train and the cleaning of late Titicaca. With the summit, the two countries also expect to strengthen ties and cooperation in the development of the Amazonian region. The president of Bolivia, Evo Morales, and the president of Peru, Martin Vizcarra, have finished the four binational cabinet in the Bolivian city of Cobija. From the year 2015, this cabinet raises solutions to the problems of its extensive common border of about 1,200 kilometers. The minister of both states also met during the weekend. The heads of state have reviewed previous agreements and also signed new ones. The project of a bioceanic train stood out. This train would join the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean with a corridor that will pass through Bolivia in an extension of almost 3,700 kilometers. It will demand almost $14 billion of investment. They also discuss security issues, integration, economic development and environment. The two countries share Lake Titicaca, the highest navigable lake in the world. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us.
affected by inequalities, abuse of power, and injustice. The American journalist Abby Martin covers the struggle for fundamental rights worldwide. Deepen into the series of files which uncover the empire's strategies. To our screen and web platform in English. The Empire Files with Abby Martin. Tuesday, only on Telesur. Welcome back. Costa Ricans have protested the arrival of Nicaraguans who are fleeing violence in their country. This is the second march against Nicaraguans in many weeks. Hundreds have marched on San Jose saying they do not want Nicaraguan migrants coming into the country. They say there are not enough jobs for those arriving. So they're allowing people to enter when we have a high unemployment rate? It's common sense. If we have a high unemployment rate, then why are thousands of people coming in and there's no source of work? What's going to happen to these thousands of people? They will commit crimes and create social chaos. And thousands of members of the Catholic and Evangelical churches in Guatemala have marched against the decriminalization of abortion. They have also protested against homosexuality. They say the natural family needs to be protected. Congress is currently discussing a bill that could approve jail sentences of up to four years for women who suffered miscarriages. The law could also increase punishments for undergoing an abortion. And the government of Guatemala is being criticized after refusing to protect human rights defenders. An independent investigation shows thousands of people are being criminalized. During a meeting in the municipality of Santa Cruz de Verapaz, these people chose to serve as human rights defenders for their communities. A human rights defender is every person who stands up to defend their land, their people's rights, be they economic, political, social or environmental. Defenders say they have voluntarily taken this role after facing a ruthless capitalist model that attacks their people. They say their roles are recognized by the United Nations. We work under a United Nations resolution. We are recognized internationally as human rights defenders. From the moment we started fighting for communal and independent rights, we became defenders. The Guatemalan government is a signee of UN Resolution 53-144, which officially recognizes and protects human rights defenders. But social organizations say this agreement isn't being upheld. They do not want to do their part. People within the government, even at high levels, demonize human rights defenders and put our lives in danger. The Human Rights Defenders Network of Guatemala say that over 6,000 defenders are suffering some form of criminalization. Big businesses are leading this criminalization campaign. They see us threatening their economic interests, so they are allied with the state who provides them with the services of the police and the public ministry. Between May and July of this year, eight human rights defenders were murdered, as the UN has deemed the situation for campesinos in Guatemala as alarming. And a group of environmentalists have denounced an attack against them in Mexico. They say the aggression occurred when they were trying to plant trees in an ecological reserve in the state of Chiapas. Around 500 people were threatened by an alleged paramilitary group that wanted them to leave the place. Environmentalists say the authorities do not do enough to protect them. And former Chilean President Michelle Bachelet has taken office as the new UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Bachelet says she will do everything possible to support victims and human rights defenders. In her first statement as High Commissioner, she has called on Myanmar to free the two Reuters journalists jailed on Monday. Insects may be the way to solve food shortages in Mexico. So far, those who have already eaten them say they're small and crunchy delights. This kitchen works non-stop preparing dishes with ingredients that date back to the pre-colonial era. 
Insects and larvae, which for a long time were eaten only by the indigenous people, have started to make their way into recipes. I didn't eat them before, but after trying them I can say they are good. This is traditional cuisine. Insects are a delight. Consuming these delicacies falls in line with Mexican cuisine. Tortillas accompany larvae and red worms simmered with garlic and chili. Chef Rigoberto says anyone can learn how to cook them. At first we thought it would be hard to cook, but we learned it's actually quite simple. Traditionally grasshoppers are collected in the fields of southern Mexico, but they are starting to be bred in the city, to be used as an alternative for healthy eating and to protect the environment. For a kilo of protein from red meat, you need 10 liters of water. For the same amount of protein from grasshoppers, you only use one or two liters. Scientific studies show that there are 400 insect species in Mexico that can be consumed and are a good source of protein, but people look down on this food. This is why experts recommend people start eating them at a young age. Children hold no prejudices, so through their instinct and curiosity, they will discover grasshoppers are quite tasty. Once you try one, you are hooked. They are delicious with some lime and a little chili. According to the National Statistics Institute, over 24 million Mexicans live in famine conditions. It's worsened by the over-reliance on processed food with low nutritional value, which has displaced more complete and nutritional ingredients. And residents from a town in El Salvador have set their streets on fire to celebrate the annual fire, Firefall Festival. Participants pelt each other with rags drenched in gasoline rolled into tight flaming balls. The festival commemorates a volcanic eruption that occurred in 1658. It is said that the hot lava that flowed from the volcano was actually the local patron Saint Jerome fighting the devil with balls of fire. And the West Indian Day Parade has taken to the streets in Brooklyn, New York as part of the Labor Day holiday. The annual carnival celebrates the culture of several Caribbean countries from Trinidad to Jamaica. People have filled the streets with costumes and soca music. New York City is home to the largest Caribbean population in the world outside of the Caribbean itself. Today when we march, march out of pride for the community you come from, march out of pride in this great city, but also march to send a message to Washington that we are a city of proud of all the people who make up New York City, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are proud to be a great city of immigrants, aren't we? Yeah. We're not weaker because of immigration, we're stronger because of immigration. We'll take a short break now, join us again after this. Developing events being presented through analysis. Our coverage transcends borders. With renowned journalist Walter Martinez. Salud amigos, tripulantes de nuestra querida, contaminada y única nave espacial. Dossier. Weekdays. Only on Telesur. Y pongo ustedes las cámaras, señor director. Welcome back. Rwandans have gone to the polls to elect members of parliament. More than 500 candidates from five political parties and four independent candidates are taking part in the election. The voting will take place over the next three days at 2,500 polling stations across the country. Political analysts say the ruling Rwandan Patriotic Front will take the majority of seats. At least 48 security force members in Nigeria have been 
uh, at least 48 security force members in Nigeria have been killed after Boko Haram militants stormed a village near the border with Nigeria. The armed groups stole weapons and military equipment before they were driven out of the base of the army. Since 2009, Boko Haram has killed 20,000 people and has forced the displacement of some 2.4 million people. And delegates at the China-Africa Cooperation Summit have made a call to strengthen bilateral relations. Our correspondent Isaura Diaz was there and brings us all the details. During the China-Africa Cooperation Summit, President Xi Jinping has announced eight measures the Asian giant will undertake over the next three years to provide $60 billion in financing to strengthen their relationship with the African continent. Among the measures are industrial development, improving infrastructure, increased imports of African products, reinforce cultural exchange, and safeguard peace and health in the continent. Xi Jinping emphasized that bilateral relations must be developed under South-South cooperation strategies and are based on mutual respect. No preconditions and no selfish or political-minded interest. The president also promoted synergy within strategies and aligning the goals of the Agenda 2063 of the African Union with those of the Belt and Road Initiative. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa praised the achievements of the Chinese-African cooperation over the past 18 years and criticized comments made by some nations that said these bilateral relations are a new form of colonialism. Nonetheless, President Ramaphosa welcomed the announcement by President Xi Jinping and showed his support for the Belt and Road Initiative, which could provide more export options for the continent, since most of the current exports are for raw material only. The summit will run until Tuesday. Thank you, Isaura. And a group of lions from South Africa has been relocated in Malawi. Malawi's Lionwind National Park lost its lion population 20 years ago. Now the first of several wild lions have been relocated to reintroduce the species. The lion population in Africa has decreased by 42% in just two decades. And September 2nd marked 49 years since the death of Vietnam's revolutionary politician and poet Ho Chi Minh. Known as Uncle Ho, he fought to defeat the colonialist presence of both France and the U.S. A Marxist by education and conviction, the leader of Vietnam's independence movement and founder of its Communist Party, Ho Chi Minh, was born on May 19, 1890, in the Annan region of central Vietnam. In 1917, he entered politics by joining the French Socialist Party, becoming involved in the activities of the Communist International. Uncle Ho, as he became known worldwide, educated himself by reading Lenin and studying the recent Russian Revolution. In 1924, during a trip to China, he organized the Revolutionary Youth and called for an anti-colonial revolution in Indochina. In 1930, he founded the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. In 1945, Ho Chi Minh created and led the front for the liberation of Vietnam in order to fight against foreign occupation. That same year, he declared the independence of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. With the defeat of the French military in 1954, Ho Chi Minh is proclaimed president of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. From there, he went on to fight against invading U.S. troops who were trying to overthrow his government, provoking the Vietnam War. Despite their huge firepower, the U.S. troops were defeated by an army that used a strategy of people's war for national salvation, freedom, sovereignty, and reunification. This revolutionary independence leader died in September 1969 at the age of 79. In his honor, and after the fall of the South Vietnam in 1975, Saigon was renamed Ho Chi Minh City. Ho Chi Minh's premise was always the same, a single Vietnam, the union of a nation. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And also join us on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.